Cricket, I'm glad to say, still holds the attention of many superior minds, but it's the sport of athletics proper which holds the highest interest from April to September. Well, there's nothing wrong in that, is there? I was a keen runner and long jumper in my youth, and not bad at throwing the hammer, either. Oh, a sport for its own sake, of course, is very fine, but the pastime is now attracting the attention of the bookmakers. Bets on matches between Oxford and Cambridge are the most unlikely events. Before we know where we are, those American universities which try so unsuccessfully to emulate ours now be opening their doors to students simply because they can play games like baseball better than others, really. Uh, it's hardly keeping up standards. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, a problem at Oxford. It was but two days after Holmes had expressed his doubts about British sporting habits with reference to universities that I found Sherlock Holmes at the task of answering letters. It was an occupation that he thoroughly disliked. He rarely engaged in small talk and found casual correspondence a waste of time. If the matter required his attention, then it was usually answered by a short telegram. On this occasion, he looked up with a slight smile of welcome and said, This may interest you, Watson. I've had a letter from the Dean of St. Mark's College, Oxford. There's been some trouble about a cheque, which he's asked me to investigate privately. It appears that some person, posing as an undergraduate and wearing the St. Mark's colours, cashed a cheque at an Oxford bank. Later, Lord Farewell, from whose private account the cheque was drawn, denied all knowledge of the transaction and claims the signature is a forgery. Not unnaturally, the Dean would prefer to have the problem solved without publicity. How much was the amount? A hundred pounds. Mm, quite a tidy sum, even for Lord Farewell. Actually, I know the young fellow slightly. His father is the Earl of Hartland, and we soldiered together out in India. I was able to treat his wounds after a skirmish near Rabal Pindi. Ah, then you must be interested. I've wired the Dean, saying that I'll accept his invitation to travel down to Oxford tomorrow morning. Are you able to accompany me? Well, I can manage a day off. Yes, I think I'd like that, Holmes. Thank you. We took the 10 o'clock train from Paddington and were at St. Mark's College in good time for lunch. The Dean entertained us for the most pleasant meal, refusing to discuss the reason for our visit until we had eaten and were comfortably seated in his study. Ah, uh, now to business. I have here on my desk the returned check about which Farewell denies all knowledge. He states that he did not make it out and that the signature is a forgery. May I see? Thank you. Uh, the amount and dates are typewritten... Only the signatures in ink. Quite. I understand that typewriters are as easily identified as handwriting and this newfangled business of taking people's fingerprints. Oh, yes. To the observant, typewriter key impressions are very easily identified. There are typewriters available in the college, of course. In the staff room, yes. The college business employs them. I can't say if there are private ones used by undergraduates. I imagine there must be. I read a number of typewritten manuscripts. Ah, then we've got something to go on. Yeah? You, you sent me, sir? Ah, yes, yes. Farewell. Please come in. Meet Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson from London. Oh, now, how do you do, Mr. Holmes? Your name is, of course, well known to me. And, of course, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Hello there, Christopher. How do you do? Haven't seen you for about three years when you won the mile at Harrow. Your father was very proud of you. I hope he will have reason to be more proud in the future. I suppose the, the dean has told of my present trouble. We have called to see if we can help. The affair is quite trivial in a way. I mean, I've been tricked out of a hundred pounds, but the paper will recompense me, but well, that's not the point. The point is that someone in this house has stooped to this method of stealing. Naturally, I felt I had to report it. Of course. I was just studying the check when you came in. Uh, tell me, how could anyone have got hold of the form? I run several accounts. I admit I've never been too careful about locking up my checkbooks. I often find them in the inner pockets of my suit, or blazers, for instance. 
The whole form and the counterfoil were ripped out of a checkbook I found in the drawer of my desk. Mm, I see. And you stay here in the college? Uh, no, no. I'm at Falcon Lodge, across the playing fields. It's private. I have the first floor. I don't think there was a, any form of burglary or anything like that. I mean, anyone could have got at my checkbook, taken it from my coat or briefcase, when I was at lecture out on the sports fields. I see. So any of your colleagues could have seized the opportunity to tear out a check form and counterfoil from the book you were carrying. You would naturally continue to write checks without being aware that one was missing. When did you become fully aware of the fraud, Lord Faber? When I saw my bank statement. I studied the returns check. I, I knew it had been a forged since I came straight to the dean. Mm. Well, looking at the check, it's clear that it is a forgery. The person who did this is an old hand at the game. How do you deduce that, Holmes? The easiest way to copy is to perfect the handwriting upside down first. I think this was so in this case. I imagine that your signature is readily available, Lord Farewell. I mean, there are specimens to be seen in public. Oh, yes, of course. I, I sign all the sports items on the next sport. The teams that are selected, for instance. Everyone knows my signature. So to obtain a copy and imitate it would be easy. Mm. I think that the typewriter that was used was also readily available, is that not so? There is one in the common room attached to the library. Everyone uses it. Mm. Well, then it should be easy to compare the type. Good. Well, it's still early afternoon. I think a walk after that excellent luncheon would be a splendid idea. I'll be able to find the bank in question, all right. Perhaps we can meet later, Dean. I shall be here at your service, Holmes. And thank you for going to all this trouble. Uh, perhaps you'd care to take tea with me at Falcon Lodge when you return. Shall we say four o'clock? Oh, that seems a very sound idea. Uh, thank you, Dean. Thank you, Lord Farewell. We shall see you around about four o'clock. Come, Watson. It was about a 15-minute walk to the main road and the bank where Lord Christopher Farewell had his accounts. The bank manager seemed to be expecting us. He listened intently to what Holmes had to say and then called at a young man who was on duty at the banking counter when the fraudulent check was cashed. Together, they listened to Holmes. I'm undertaking a private investigation into the cashing of this forged check. So far, we've only established that it was typed on a communal typewriter at St. Mark's College. It could have been signed by anyone. Now, you were on duty when the undergraduate presented the check. You can speak quite freely in front of Mr. Holmes Hughes. This is all in confidence. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I was. Uh, I must tell you that I've not been working here for very long. Uh, the Oxford undergraduates who use this bank are, are, are not known to me. Perhaps you would be able to give a description of this one. Oh, Do yes. you remember him? Oh, yes, yes. It, it, it was a very rainy afternoon, and, and we were near to closing hours. And He came in wearing a wet Macintosh and the St. Mark's College cap, and he had a scarf of the same colours wrapped around his neck. In other words, quite muffled up. You could only see his hands and face. That's right. All I can really remember is that, well, he wore spectacles, the, the thin steel-rimmed kind, and, and he peered a bit through them. Did he speak to you? Oh, just a few words. I, I, I can't recall exactly what they were. It was, it was something like, a rough afternoon, please cash this for my friend. Did he have uh, any sort of accent? No, 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 no. He, he, he seemed to be choosing his words very carefully and speaking quite precisely in a, a rather affected English. Mm, quite common in undergraduates at Oxford. Anxious to be correct in every way. Anything else you observed? Only that when I gave him the hundred pounds in notes, he, he placed them in an envelope that he had with him and he wrote the amount on the outside. You did? It's a very strange thing to do. I wonder why. Oh, I don't know. Oh, and, and there, there is one more thing I noticed. He wrote with his left hand. Ah, I see. Well, thank you very much, Hughes. Uh, thank you, sir. You've been most kind in granting this interview. I am sorry we could not have been of more help. You have been exceedingly helpful. Come, Watson. We shall be late for tea at Falcon Lodge. Good afternoon to you, sir. I do help yourself to more cucumber sandwiches, if you wish. Perhaps. I always take tea down here on the ground floor terrace. Well, thank you. I rarely eat at this time of the afternoon. Dare I inquire if you're any farther forward in your investigations? I think a little, yes. Uh, tell me, have you anyone in this college who is an American, short-sighted, and left-handed? Goodness gracious me, oh, what a question. It's a three-part one, too. Well, the answer is yes. There is a man here who is an American, Guy Lewis. He is left-handed, and he is rather short-sighted. He, he wears those American steel-rimmed spectacles. You know the kind. Is he a friend of yours? No, no not really. I, I always feel so ill at ease with foreigners... But he is an extremely fine sportsman. Excellent oarsman, good runner. Could well get his blue this term. Why? Because evidence is building up against him. Is he in need of money, do you know? Oh, dashed if I know. I shouldn't think so. His family hit it rich in the Yukon or some outlandish place. Uh, 
Are you suggesting that he is the man who forged my signature? No, I'm simply trying to establish facts. And the facts are that he fits the description of the person who... Uh, gracious, what was that? It sounds as though it came from the floor above. But my study is directly above this... Di- it's locked. I've taken the precaution of locking everything up since this business of the check. I, w- I wonder, do you think that... I think we should go up to your rooms immediately, Lord Farewell. Perhaps someone is still intent upon tricking you out of even more money. Shall we go? The rooms occupied by Lord Farewell were small and self-contained. They consisted of bathroom and shower, a small bedroom, and a large sitting room, which was also used as a study. They were directly above the dining room, kitchen, and terrace room. It was a few moments before we could climb the stairs and unlock the main door. Then, there was a small passage into the sitting room. That door was also locked. Christopher Farewell had his keys, and soon we were standing in the elegantly furnished apartment. It was immediately clear that there had been an intruder. A chair near the window had been overturned. The window itself was open, with lace curtains flapping in the breeze. Great heavens! Someone's just been in here. The the drawer of my desk is open. Yes, well, whoever it was got away through that window. My bureau. The lock's been forced. Part of my stamp collection is missing. The latest stamps. I I was about to paste them into the album. They're very valuable stamps. They've gone. You were right, Miss Holmes. Someone is intent on getting money from me. Now, what on earth are we to do? Remain calm. Now, you locked up the whole of this self-contained apartment. Is there any other entrance? Well, no, just, just the main door to the stairs and ground floor. Well, it seems clear how the thief got away, but how did he get in here? Blessed if I know. It, he couldn't have been in here before I'd locked up. I went into all my rooms, washed my hands, changed my blazer, collected my keys. It, it, it's impossible. Well, then I think I'd better examine the window. Ah, uh, I think that there's a flat roof right outside here. A stretch of about seven feet before the drop into the grounds. One can actually get out onto the lead surface, yes. Uh, do yes. be careful, Mr. Yes. Yes, that's it. Yes, this must be the roof over the terrace rooms. Two bays. I suppose it is possible to jump down. It's quite a drop, all of ten to twelve feet. Ah, what have we here? There are numerous indentations in the lead. But this looks recently made. It's here by the guttering. Most curious. It couldn't have been made by a ladder. A, 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 a rope, perhaps? No, 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 no. It's too broad for that. That's quite a mystery. Now, shall we go down and examine the earth beneath? Yes, please. Then you better make a thorough search of all your belongings and report the whole incident to the dean. Come, there's nothing more to be gained out here. Holmes and I made our way down to the grounds while Christopher Farewell made a thorough check of all his possessions. We knew the alarm would soon be raised and the whole of the college agog with the news. It was one of those spectacular incidents that could not be hushed up. The burglary had actually happened above us while we were quietly drinking tea and eating cucumber sandwiches. I thought it all had an air of unreality about it. But Holmes was not at all put out. He went over the gardens under the window with his usual thoroughness. Ah, yes, here in the grass. This is freshly marked. See, Watson? Hmm. Yes, it's a sort of triangular indentation. I think I can actually remove this section of turf. Yes, it could be valuable. Yes, I wonder if anyone here at the college comes from the Thames country. Well, well, why do you ask that, Holmes? That's just a thought. Following the logical conclusions of the evidence so far. Oh, oh yes, Christopher, oh, some of his friends. Holmes and... Oh, uh, Mr. Holmes, I, I'd like you to meet a few of the men from my college. This is Jonathan. So how do you do? Shocking business. Uh, my friend Eric Davidson. How do you do? I can't believe all that Chris has been telling us. And this is our American scholar, Guy Lewis. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Holmes. I, I guess this is something no one ever thought would happen. A thief at St. Mark's. I, I don't get it. Uh, I'm pleased to meet you all. Um, I know that this is likely to cause a lot of talk and a great deal of scandal should it become public knowledge. I think you should remember the college and try to hush it all up. The news may be given out by the dean as he thinks fit. But you know what will happen if the press gets hold of this. Yes, indeed. Could go a long way to smear the reputation of Oxford. And with the big sports encounter with Cambridge coming up, well, it won't do us any good. I agree. I am the one who's been chosen as a victim, but I must insist that we keep this within the house. I know you're all good friends and will support me in this request. We will. But it can't be overlooked, Chris. The man who did this must be found. 
searched. It isn't stopped. Who knows where it will all end? Oh, I agree. I think there should be a general search made of everyone's rooms. It needn't be rowdy. Just quietly and methodical. What do you say, Guy? Uh, uh, sure. I go along with that. Sure. Why not? Right. Let's put it all to the dean as quietly as we can. We must be guided by him and Mr. Holmes. Uh, now, what do you say, Chief? Holmes watched the retreating backs of the young men with a thin-lipped smile. I could tell that he'd already formed a theory, but was not prepared to discuss it. It wasn't until over an hour later, when we were gathered in the dean's study, that Christopher Farewell entered hurriedly. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I wondered if you were available. And Mr. Holmes. Uh, ah, good. You are still here, sir. My stamps have been found. Ah, they have. And may I ask where? They were found at the back of a drawer in, in Guy Lewis's study, sir. I see. Hmm. Well, this is a very serious matter, Farewell. What does the young man say? He protests his innocence. Says he knows nothing about the stamps. He, he maintains that he's not responsible either for the forged check or the theft of the stamps. Mm-hmm. He must be given a fair hearing, of course, but it does seem that he has a great deal of explaining to do. Uh, Mr. Holmes, you are the expert on these matters. What do you recommend? Well, with your permission, I should like a select group of your friends, including Mr. Guy Lewis, to gather here in the Dean's study as soon as possible. Yes, I think I can rely upon you, Lord Farewell, to choose the right men. Those I've just met, for instance, Jollyfant, Eric Davidson, a few more for a chosen athletes. They must all be sworn to secrecy for the sake of the college. Can you arrange that for me straight away? Of course, it was arranged. And within 20 minutes, the half a dozen young men were seated quietly in front of the dean. Holmes immediately took the floor. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to address a group such as yourselves in a place of learning such as this. I'm very pleased to do so. I'm just disappointed that the circumstances are so unpleasant. As a private investigator, I've always maintained that crime is never what it appears on the surface. Not big crimes or international intrigues, or small crimes such as fraud and theft. I don't think the trouble here lies with the usual motives of love or money. As you all know, Lord Farewell has been cheated out of 100 pounds, and has had part of a stamp collection stolen. He's the first to admit that these are petty crimes, but they are not what they appear on the surface. Oh, no. If I can reveal the name of the person responsible for all this trouble, would you drop any charges against him, Lord Farewell? If it were for the sake of the college, then yes, of course I would. And what does the sake of the college mean? It means maintaining the good reputation that St. Mark's has when entering to the next games, is that not so? I'm afraid that is where the danger lies. Athletics is a branch of sport that has hitherto been almost entirely free from professionalism and the evils of betting. But now, competition has risen to such a state that it has become work and not play. Now, this is the basic reason for the petty crimes we are investigating. A most interesting thesis, Holmes, but uh, I'm blessed if I can see how. Well, let me show you. But first, to get back to the crimes themselves. Excuse me, sir. Wouldn't it be better if we just ask the man himself to admit his guilt? Quite. Come on, Lewis. You know you've been caught out. I have not. And I don't admit to anything. I'm not guilty. Uh, just one oh, moment, just one, one moment. That's very overwhelming. Now, let me start with you, Mr. Lewis. When I carried out an investigation at the local bank regarding the cashing of the forged checks, the cashier described the man to whom he gave the money as muffled up in cap and mackintosh. Then it could have been anyone. <laughs> at the time this took place, you were nowhere to be found. I was out walking. It was a dreary day, but I wanted exercise. I was quite alone. That is no alibi. The man was wearing spectacles and was left-handed. He spoke very precise English, which could be an effort to conceal an American accent. Now look here, this just isn't fair. The check which was typed out, had the dates of the day and the month transposed. In England, we put the day first, then the month, and the year. Of course, it's correct. In America, it's the month, the day, and the year. All this adds up. As the stamps were found in your study, the case against you looks complete. But, as I have said, most crimes are not what they appear. Supposing there was someone in the college who wanted you to be disgraced, dismissed from the college and the sports, then wouldn't it be a simple matter to imitate you? A pair of steel rimmed glasses, easily obtainable. The subtle typing of an American way of dating a check. The affected voice. Even the unnecessary writing of the amount taken on an envelope so that the cashier should note that the left hand was used. Uh, look here, Mr. Holmes. Do you mean someone was trying to get Lewis wrongfully accused? Yes, that is exactly what I do mean. It's all too obvious. It's all too pat. Guy Lewis is quite innocent. You're right, Mr. Hopkins. Thank you. Sir. Then who has committed this annoyance? Well, it would be someone who, in the first place, would like a hundred pounds in ready cash, or a gambling debt, perhaps. Two, someone who wants very much to be included in the Oxford sports team, 
desperate for his blue. Three, someone who is jealous of you, Lord Farewell. Perhaps a lady friend. Well, but... but that, that can only be... It, it can't be. Four, someone who is a fine athlete and a very fine pole vaulter. What? A pole vaulter? None of us is a pole vaulter. Except... Except Eric Davidson, Lord Farewell's best friend. A man whom I suspect is rather in debt. A man who is in love with your current lady friend, Lord Farewell. A man who is desperate to get into the Oxford team and has probably got a lot of money on certain events, particularly the pole vault. The distance from the ground to the lead roof outside your rooms is over ten feet, Lord Farewell. Eric Davidson is the only one who can clear that distance. At least according to your sporting records, which I took care to examine. This, this isn't true. You, you can't prove a thing against me. No, I think we can. I took an impression from the turf outside Falcon Lodge. I'm willing to bet that your vaulting pole has a triangular base such as is used up in the Fen district. The spikes will fit the turf specimen exactly. You've been a little too clever all along, haven't you, Davidson? Well, gentlemen, I've concluded my investigation. If you examine all the facts I've placed before you, you'll find my conclusions are perfectly correct. What steps you take against this man who has so outmaneuvered you is not my business. I just regret that jealousy and deception can exist to this degree in an institution such as this. Well, that is all. Would you excuse us, Dean? I think there is a diner on the nine o'clock train back to London, Watson. Shall we go? It was some weeks after this that Holmes paused while refilling his pipe and turned the newspaper over to the back pages. There were the sports results in full. Mm. Mm. Uh -huh. I see that the results are here of the athletics meeting between Oxford and Cambridge. Most interesting. Well, what about young Christopher Farewell? Does it mention him? Oh, yes, quite prominently. Marx acquitted itself well. Good to see that the American Guy Lewis was very much to the fore. He won the sprint events quite easily. And the pole vault? Cambridge won. No mention of Eric Davidson. I imagine he's no longer at St. Mark's. <laughs> well, let's hope we never hear about that young man again. He's far too ingenious a mind. The sort of mind that makes a good criminal. Or perhaps a good private investigator. <laughs> well, one can only hope, Watson. One can only hope. <laughs> Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson.